All right. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for being here so early on this, frankly, quite miserable day. Today's subject uh, is the second methodology lecture. So again, we're not going to talk about what machine learning, uh, how machine learning models work or how we search for good models. We're going to talk about uh, data about how to do the things around training the machine learning model. In this case, we're going to talk about data pre-processing, everything you do before you feed your data to a machine learning model. So here's a motivating example, a little story. This is um, a photograph from the Second World War. They used to have big planes like these, these bombers that went on bombing runs uh, over Europe. And uh, they would be shot at, and sometimes they would come back looking like this. Um, and the Second World War was the start of what's called operations research, where people started studying these things and collecting data on these kinds of things. <clears throat> so they collected data on where their planes were most likely to get shot. And they gave that to a bunch of uh, statisticians and asked, OK, uh, collect this data for us, please, uh, and tell us where we should reinforce the planes. And at first, the first instinct was to take the data and reinforce the planes where they were getting hit the most. So this is all the places where, uh, not a bomber, but I don't know what kind of plane this is, another kind of plane uh, would be hit a lot. So they would look at this and say, well, reinforce the tips of the wings, reinforce the central part, reinforce this part, uh, until one of the statisticians, and I wrote it, out, wrote it down this time, called Abraham Wald, um, who studied this, said, well, that's not what we should do because we don't have the full picture here. We're not seeing where all the planes are getting shot. We're seeing where all the planes are getting shot that came back. So these are all the pla places where a plane can be shot and still come back. The places we should reinforce are the places where we don't see a dot. Because, the place, because basically, uh, the real distribution of bullet holes on the plane will be uniform, which means that if a plane gets shot here in the nose, it will not come back. So the moral of the story for us here is that you shouldn't take your data at face value. You should always consider where your data came from and what data you're not seeing. So don't just say, well, I have a table, my data is a table, so I might as well feed it into a machine learning model. You have to think about what your data is, where it comes from, and what you're ultimately trying to do with it. So that's hopefully something we'll come back to a couple of times. More practically, we are going to where did I put my pen? Yeah. Talk about these subjects. First up, data cleaning. Oh. Uh, so if you have missing data, if you have outliers, what should you do with it? How do you get your data into such a state that the machine learning model will even accept it? Uh, then choosing features, as we saw, features are things you choose based on the examples that you want to learn from. Uh, so those are choices you make in your data pre-processing. And what we'll see is that in that part of the process, you can already do quite a lot of modeling. This is already, if you spend a lot of time and effort on, your, on choosing your features, you're basically already doing machine learning. Uh, so this is a very big part of the process, and it's really not quite such a clean separation between data pre-processing and data analysis. Um, so then the break, and we'll talk about data normalization. with an S I went for here. I think it's with a Z later in the slides. Um, which is just making sure that all your features have roughly the same scale of numbers, which can be very important for some machine learning algorithms. Then we'll talk about dimensionality reduction, which is what you do if you have a model that cannot handle very many features. Some models are sort of, yeah, uh, 
a little expensive to train on a lot of features. And if you do have a lot of features, then you need to reduce the number. And we'll look at just one method called principal component analysis. And there we see that some d data preprocessing methods can really show some, um, can really be quite magical in some sense. That they, uh, yeah, this is really sort of getting into machine learning already. Uh, and to illustrate that, I'll show a couple of examples of what PCA can do. And the most interesting example is so interesting, I put it in the menu. It's called eigenfaces. Uh, and I should also mention that this year I've split PCA. PCA is quite a difficult subject to explain. So I've split it in two parts. We'll discuss it on one level this week. And then in week six, I think, we'll come back to it and we'll discuss some of the more technical and mathematical aspects of it. Um, so that's the plan for today. Lots of stuff to talk about. So let's dig right in with um, data cleanup. How do we, we get a big bag of messy data? How do we clean it up so that a machine learning model can handle it? So the first thing you usually encounter is missing data. Almost no data sets are complete. Uh, so let's start there. And two things can be missing. Your labels can be missing or your values. So here we have a data set with a, a target column, target class, whether they are unemployed and some of the values of some of the feature columns are missing. You can also have the missing labels where all the features are complete, but some of your labels are missing. And even though they look the same, how you handle this uh, differs between the two cases. Uh, so let's start with the val missing values. If you have missing values, if you don't have a lot of missing values, uh, or rather, um, if the missing values are only in one feature column, and that feature column is not that important, you can just remove the feature. It's the easiest solution. But if you do that too much, you're throwing away a lot of data, so you don't always want to do that. Um, so that's like removing a column from your data. You can also remove rows from your data where the values are missing, but that's more dangerous because the data might not be missing uniformly. So for instance, if you're gathering data, let's say you have a bunch of volunteers and they're gathering data using a hardware device, they go into cities and ask people questions, for instance, and they type it into these little pads. And for one of your volunteers in Amsterdam, their device was malfunctioning. So that's where the missing data came from. If you then remove those missing data from your uh, table, you are getting less responses from Amsterdam, so you're changing the source distribution of your data. So you don't want to do that. So in those cases, you want to leave the instances, leave the features, and deal with it some other way. How do you deal with it? Well, first, a bit of meta, uh, meta advice. For all these kinds of situations where you think, I have some data, I don't really know what I'm supposed to be doing with it. Uh, my advice is to think about what you ultimately want to do with the data or with the model that comes out of the data. So that's what I call think about the real world use case. So ultimately, you're going to use this data, it's machine learning, so you're going to train a model and you're going to use that model for something. Uh, we'll call that the production setting, which is a kind of software term for once you've developed your software, it goes into production and that's sort of where it runs live and the users use it. Um, so when I say a machine learning model going into production, that could be literally in production, like as part of software, it goes out into the world. But it could also, maybe you're training um, a model for business analytics, so then it's not really part of a software thing, but you're using it for something. Whatever you're using it for, we'll call that production. And whatever happens to the model in production, that's what you're trying to simulate. That's what the test set is for, and that's what all this uh, missing value, uh, these methods for dealing with missing value are for. So specifically in the case of missing values, the question is, in production, will you get uh, missing data as well? So in the example I just mentioned, probably not. Probably this uh, malfunctioning hardware device can be solved in production. So you can expect to have no missing values whenever the model goes into production. In which case, uh, oh, I started with yes. So, uh, but for instance, if you have, um, let's say a web form where people can fill in a bunch of stuff, but also leave a form open if they want to, then that can happen in production as well. So then you just need to deal with the missing values in production. 
So then you need to build a model that can somehow deal with missing values. So if it's categoric, you can just make it a new category called missing. If it's numeric, you need to deal with it some other way, depending on the use case. Uh, but you need to make a model that can consume missing values, and then you, you can just leave them in the test set, because that's what you're testing for. If not, so if you don't expect to see missing values in production, you should you want the test set to simulate the production settings, so sh you should try somehow, as best you can, to get a test set without missing values. Because that's the setting you want to, uh, to simulate when you test your model. Um, and then on the training set, you can test different methods for completing the data so that the model is trained as much as you possibly can on complete looking data. Uh, see if I'm skipping anything. Oh yeah, uh, slightly skipping out about all over the place, but um, I had a question here. Remove the, you can remove the instances if the data is missing uniformly, so how do you know? Um, there's no real surefire way to tell, but you can usually, if you plot a histogram, you can usually figure it out that it's uh, that the data is, is missing uh, without any particular bias for a particular place. So you need to do sort of inspect your data and, and uh, feel your way through that. So if we're in this, this, uh, sorry, this case, so we have a test set without missing values, uh, then the question comes, what should we do on the training set? How do we deal with these missing values? Actually, that's in both cases. How do we do the, deal with these missing values in the training set? And one thing you can do is to guess the missing values. That's called imputation. The very simple way of doing it is to, uh, if you have categorical data, just fill in the mode. So with whichever category happens the most in your data, you use that for the missing values. If it's numerical data, you can use the mean. Come back to that later. Uh, or the median. Uh, I'll uh, show some reasoning for the distinction later. Uh, so that's a very simple way of filling in the missing data. If you don't have very much missing data, that probably won't affect your results too much, and it helps you um, train your model. If you have more missing data, you probably don't want to do this, uh, because it sort of skews your distribution towards, this, uh, towards the mean or towards the mode too much. So you need to do something more clever, uh, one thing you can do is, in this table, ignore the target column and make the uh, column with the missing values the new target column. And if it's categorical data in the feature column with the missing data, then you have a classification problem. So you can build a classifier to uh, fill in the missing values. And if it's a numeric data, then you have a, a numeric feature, then you have a regression model. So you can build a regression model to fill in the missing values. If you have missing labels, that's a bit a slightly different problem. On the training set, uh, if there's not too many missing and if they're missing uh, uniformly, you can just train only on the labeled data, and you roughly you'll get roughly the same uh, same effect. Uh, if there's more missing, you can impute the missing labels. So you could do sort of two-step approach. So you train on the, no, the data with non-missing labels. You predict the missing labels, and then you train again. And that sort of leads to if what you do if you have many missing labels, if only a very small proportion of your data set is labeled, uh, you can do something called semi-supervised learning. Uh, well, there's lots of techniques for that, so if you run into that problem, then just... Google that phrase, but one way to do it is to um, build a classifier on the non-missing data, the small proportion of non-missing data that you have, complete the data, fill in all the missing labels, train again, complete the data again, train again, and do that loop until you converge. That's the sort of simplest way of doing semi-supervised learning. On the test set, you should be more careful. Don't, uh, hold on, I'll get to you in a sec. Um, don't impute on the test set, because the test set is not, uh, that, that will 
give you some, uh, basically the test set is there to tell you how good your model is. So really, if you have missing values in your test set, you just have some uncertainty. You just don't know how well your classifier is doing on the whole data. And you should report that uncertainty rather than trying to hide it by imputing your data. So the best thing to do, I think, is just uh, compute the accuracy on your missing labels, on your sorry, on the non-missing parts of the data. And then uh, you can compute the worst case and the best case accuracy. So the worst case is that you get all the missing labels wrong, and the best case is that you get all of them right. And your true accuracy is just somewhere in that range. And that's all. That's the best you can say if your test set has missing labels. Uh, yes, you had a question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I guess to summarize, how does this relate to the previous slide? Um, where we were also, in the most complicated case, training a model to fill in the data. Uh, basically, for every column in your data, you would have to train a new model because the target column is different, so it's a new model. So if you do both, if you, miss, if you fill in both the missing values and the missing labels, then you would first train a model for every, column that have, uh, every feature column that has missing values and then do the uh, sort of semi-supervised learning thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, so the, um, uh, yes, uh, so the question is how does that differ between the training and the test set? In this case, you would reuse the trained model to uh, complete the test set as well. Uh, but you would not use the model uh, with the semi-supervised approach, you just end up with the model. So you would not complete the test set here. So that's the difference. Or rather, I mean, you're completing the whole test set because you never get to see the labels of the test set anyway. So it's more like you're completing the whole test set, but that's what you're doing with any classifier. Anyway, so that's missing labels. Um, in general, I would say start simple and only make it complicated if you need to. So sometimes fill in the meat and the moan, the uh, mode and the mean, and you'll be fine. Which brings us to the next topic, uh, outliers. Sometimes you have instances in your data that don't look like the other instances. Uh, so you need to figure out what to do with that, if you need to do anything with that. Before I go into that, some point, a point I always forget to include a slide for. Uh, this sort of thing, detecting outliers, you can only figure out that you have outliers if you look at your data. And you see a lot of, I see a lot of students who just um, figure out, well, my data is a table, so I load the table into pandas, and I stick it into a machine learning model, and I measure the performance. Ideally, you would not do that, and you would look at your data first. A large part of uh, a data science project is looking at your data to figure out what it looks like, what the patterns are, what you can expect from it, and what you can learn from it rather than just blindly applying a bunch of machine learning models to it. And one of the things you see when you look at your data is weird stuff like this, like these outliers. And the first thing to ask if you see outliers is are they natural outliers or unnatural outliers? So here we have a sort of natural data distribution uh, of maybe weight versus uh, height or something, and a bunch of instances that, that just don't follow that distribution, where you think, okay, clearly something went wrong here. Quite often, this happens when a, a data system doesn't allow a natural way for filling in missing values. People then set the missing values to minus one, and then you get something like this. <coughs> um, so if you see this, these are unnatural outliers. They're outside of your data distribution. So you can basically treat them like missing values. So remove them if you can remove them, impute them otherwise, uh, that sort of thing. And everything I said about missing values then applies to the unnatural outliers. 
There's also something called a natural outlier. Uh, so if you have the income distribution, then there are some people who just have lots and lots of money. So this distribution is something called a, um, a scale-free distribution to set it apart from distributions that have a definite scale. So if you look at people's height, for instance, that has a definite scale. I mean, everybody has a different height. There's a bit of variance, but there are pretty clear boundaries, even though it's officially normally distributed. So officially, every height is possible, except lower than zero. Uh, we can be pretty sure that people shorter than one meter are very rare, taller than two and a half meter are also extremely rare, taller than three meters we probably will never see, and taller than four meters we will never ever see. So there's a definite scale. We know what to expect when it comes to height. Uh, we know that there are basically areas of mathematical impossibility. Uh, income is not distributed normally, not distributed uh, with a distribution that has a definite scale. Uh, certainly most people have a, an income in this area, but even if you double the income, even if you multiply it by 10, you get to a million, there are still millionaires, there are still people who make 10 million a year, there are still people who make 100 million a year, there are still people who make possibly a billion a year. So even if you multiply it out, there will still be people making those amounts of money. So that's as distinct from a normal distribution where you, there's nobody who's 10 meters tall. Even if you just multiply by 10 once, you're way out of the scale. Uh, so that's a natural outlier, which is just part of the data distribution. So you don't want to remove this, because that's just important information. If you're fitting a distribution to this data, you need this point here to fit the distribution properly. So if you have natural outliers, leave them in. There's another example if your data set is images, on, uh, if your data set is images of faces, on the uh, right here, that's clearly not a face, so that's just some glitch. You can throw it out. But this on the left here, Marty Feldman, that's just an unnatural, uh, sorry, that's just a natural outlier, but with extreme features. Uh, Ba the main question, are they mistakes or unnatural? Uh, deal with them, then deal with them as you would missing values. If not, you can leave them in, you should leave them in. But make sure that your model doesn't assume that the data is normally distributed. Because if you do this, if you fit a normal distribution to this, which we'll look at in some detail, um, this will still be uh, this will still be a massive outlier. So it will. Uh, well, we'll see that in a minute. What happens if you do that? But the important thing is, think about normality assumptions. So I'll come back to that. Uh, but just to finish the slide, and again, think about the use case. Can you expect these outliers in production? Uh, if so, make sure that the model can deal with them. So the, whatever process you use to remove the outlier, you should automate so that the model can first throw out the outliers if it encounters them. Uh, if not, then just remove them and make sure they're not in the test set. That's a good point. Uh, so it's going back to what I said slightly earlier. How do you actually look at the data? So I said, look at your data, look at your data. Uh, but actually your data is you know, a hundred dimensional point cloud. Um, so looking at your data is not just making one scatter plot, it's a process. Basically, what you can do is pick out two features and say, well, I wonder how they relate. You do a scatter plot of that, and that's either interesting or not interesting. You do that a bunch of times, you generate questions for yourself, and using those questions, you generate other plots. Uh, yeah, so there's no surefire way to look at all of your data in one go because we cannot visualize high dimensional data. Uh, but you have to go through this kind of process and that's sort of, that's what we hope you will be doing between now and uh, when you start training your machine learning models in the project attached to this course. So let's look at these normality assumptions a little bit. 
Uh, and we'll look at that in the case of uh, finding a central value. So we talked earlier about these missing values uh, or these uh, unnatural outliers that are also missing values. Uh, and what we do, uh, what we wanted to do in those cases was replace the missing values with a single value that is representative for the data set, that is sort of central to the data set. Um, uh, so one way to uh, define that, these are the points that we do know. So this is the, what our data set looks like, how it's distributed. We can say we're looking for a point M that minimizes the distance to all the other points. So here's a distance to uh, Bill Gates for this point M. We want to minimize this. So that's a, bit, a lot like this linear regression that we talked about, but in one dimension. So this is our sort of line, as it were, this point. This is our residual, the distance to all the other points. And we can just square those residuals. Uh, so this is the sort of the error, the distance uh, to all the other points, how good an approximation M is to all the other points. We square it for all the points and we sum it. So what M minimizes that value? Well, we should be comfortable with a little bit of calculus now. Oh, something's gone slightly wrong with the animations. I'm giving away the punchline. So start up top here. That's our objective. We want to minimize this function. So we take the derivative and we set it equal to zero. We're not going to bother with gradient descent this time. We're going to just solve it. So we want the derivative of that, uh, and we've worked the sum out already. We want the derivative of this uh, residual here. So we apply the chain rule. If the chain rule is still a little unfamiliar, I strongly recommend that you practice it. Uh, look it up and practice it because it will come back a lot. Uh, so we have this thing here, m minus xi squared. The chain rule applied just means we take the derivative of the square over whatever we're squaring times whatever we're squaring over m, which is what we're originally taking the derivative over. So you sort of telescope it out. Uh, the thing on the right, m minus x over m is just 1. The square is two times the thing we're squaring over. So the two falls out of the sum. So we just get the sum of the uh, two times the sum of the resid residuals. We set that equal to one. Uh, the two disappears because we've set it equal to one. So the two doesn't matter. Uh, we work this sum out in the, to the two terms. So we get, I, uh, we get one sum over m a bunch of times once for every time in our data, so this is n times n, where n is the number of points in our data, minus the sum of the data. And then if we rewrite this, so we work the sum to the other side and we divide by n, we see that m is just the mean. This is just the sum of the data divided by the number of elements in the data. So if we didn't follow along, don't worry. The optimal solution to this objective is the mean. So if we want to minimize the sum of the residuals, the sum of the squares of the residuals, sorry, the mean will do that for us. And here we see that, and we'll look into this a little bit more when we start talking about probability, but we see that when we talk about the sum of the squares, there's actually a normality assumption. There's, a, there's an assumption of scale. Because, as we see, these squares disproportionately punish outliers. So this is here we see how strongly Bill Gates pulls on this particular mean. So you can think of these residuals as rubber bands pulling on the mean, as opposed to somebody who's right next to the mean. And it's not a function of the distance, it's a function of the square of the distance. So this is why sum of squared, uh, why we, uh, if we take the sum of the squares, we are assuming a kind of definite scale in our data. If we don't want that, we can assume a different distribution. And instead, we can take the, uh, not the squares, but the absolute value. So we just sum the absolute value. We remove the sign. If it's negative, we just remove the minus. And we sum all those values. So we just sum all these residuals directly, the absolute values. 
Uh, then we get another objective, so we take the derivative of that, set it equal to zero, chain rule. Uh, the thing on the right again disappears. So we need the derivative of the absolute function, uh, which looks like this. So it's the identity if x is positive, and if x is negative, then it's the identity, but mirrored over the horizontal axis, just with the sign removed. So if x is positive, the derivative is 1, and if x is negative, the derivative is minus 1, uh, which is the sine function. That's called the sine function. The sine function just looks at the input, and if it's positive, says plus 1. If it's negative, says minus 1. If it's 0, says 0. So the derivative of this is the sine function. So the optimal m is the value for which, if we sum the signs of all these residuals, the sum is zero. And that happens if the number of elements to the left of m is the same as the number of elements to the right of m. Because this is positive is, uh, if x is to the left of m and negative if x is to the right of m. So if we have equal numbers of those, we get a bunch of minus ones and a bunch of plus ones, we sum them all up and we get zero. In other words, m is the median. M is the point where we have the same number of data sets, uh, data points to our right as the number of data points to our left. So if we take the median, we have less, uh, we don't have this assumption of scale. We are less sensitive to outliers and we are better equipped to uh, model distributions with fat tails. This is important. For instance, if you hear somebody saying, uh, I don't understand why everybody's always talking about poverty in the United States. The United States is the third richest country by personal wealth on average. That's true. You can go to Wikipedia, it looks like this. List of countries by wealth, you sort by the mean, mean wealth per adult, you see the United States in the third place. So you might say the United States doesn't have any poverty at all. But you can also sort by median wealth instead. And what you see then is that the United States drops rather a lot to the 22nd place. Because the mean wealth is pulled massively towards the outliers, so that just means there's lots of billionaires in the US. And the median wealth is a much better reflection of where most people are. And the difference between these two values is actually a good indication of income equality. Uh, if there's anybody from the US in the audience, I'm uh, not getting on my high horse here because the Netherlands drops from the 12th place to the 34th place. So we have very much a similar problem. Plenty of billionaires in the Netherlands as well. Um, so just think about these assumptions of normality. So beware of squared errors, and we'll look again at this uh, if we... Uh, when we start talking about probability. All right, Let's see if we can speed up a little bit. Uh, we talked a lot about class imbalance in the last lecture. That was important. We had this problem that uh, if we have class imbalance, we don't have a lot of uh, items to test on. So if you have class imbalance, first thing to do is use a very big test set. That's what we talked about last time. Um, make your test set extra big. Don't rely on accuracy, also what we talked about. Um, but then you have to deal with this problem in your training data. How do you actually ensure? So you, we know how to test a model with class imbalance. We know how to uh, evaluate this. But how do we actually train a model so that it gets good AUC value or that it good, gets good precision and recall? That it doesn't just focus on this majority class because it's so... Uh, overrepresented. And the simplest way to do this is to um, resample your training data. There's two ways to do this. You can oversample. So you just start with your imbalanced data set and you sample with replacement uh, a bunch of extra uh, classes so that your uh, minority class is overrepresented. And you get lots of repeats, but at least it helps a little bit. Or you can do undersampling, where you sample without replacement the majority class. 
your data set gets smaller, uh, but you don't have these repeated instances. And you can do a little bit of both. So that's sort of the simple approach. There's a bunch of more complicated approaches. If you run into this problem, have a look at Smote, uh, which just does sort of data augmentation type stuff. Uh, but remember, only do this on the training data. The test data is a set, is a, uh, uh, a simulation of the production environment, so that's what you want to test on. That's what you want to make sure your, uh, uh, yeah, that's what, what indicates your performance. So you don't want to modify your test data. Um, so if you have in your project unbalanced data, make sure to think about these things. Then, choosing your features. So you uh, download a data set. It might look something like this. So you might think, well, that's already a machine learning problem, right? We have rows, we have columns. Uh, but actually, a lot of these are not numeric or categoric. So dates are not numbers. Phone numbers are not numbers. So you need to deal with this. Because machine learning models won't know what to do with the dates. So you need to translate it either to a category or a number. Uh, ah, good question. Back to the oversampling, undersampling. Uh, when do you use which? Uh, I think in general you want to oversample. Let me see what I've written here. Uh, because it gets you more data. Uh, undersampling gets you less data, which is never a good thing. Um, the only problem is if that you have these duplicates in your data set. So if your model cannot handle duplicates very well, uh, then you should undersample. Uh, and one thing you can do if, if you're doing something like gradient descent, so you do multiple passes over your data, you can resample each epoch. So every time you do a, a pass over your data, you resample the data, and then you're still looking at all these training samples. You're just looking at the training samples less often than the, uh, the red samples less often than the blue samples. But in general, you want bigger data sets. So in general, I think you want to go for oversampling. So getting features. Um, so we need to figure out for these non-numeric or non-categorical features how to turn them into uh, numbers or categories. Uh, it sort of depends on what feature you have uh, and on what classifier or what, what machine learning model you have. Some machine learning models accept only numeric features, some accept only categoric features, and some accept a mixture. So depending on what machine learning model you want to train, you need to adapt your choices. Uh, so if we have something like age, that's easy. That's a number. Uh, so we can just map the integers to real values because they're most of these machine learning models want real valued numeric columns. That's not really an issue, usually. Uh, if you need categorical data, you'll have to bin it into uh, bins, uh, group it into bins. So if you have two bins, you can just say above or below the median. Um, but then information loss is unavoidable. But if you have just one numeric feature and all the other ones are categoric, and you want to you know that a categoric classifier is, is the best option, uh, then it might still be good to just take that information loss. If you have something like phone numbers, you might think, hey, this looks like a number. We can just translate that to an integer and feed it to our data. That's not a good idea, because the, even though it looks like a number, ordering this numerically doesn't tell you anything interesting. There's no meaning in the information here, in the, uh, the numerical ordering here. Um, so that's problematic and that won't do anything for you. There is meaning, for instance, in the, uh, preceding, the first digits. So that tells you whether it's a landline or a uh, mobile phone number. So you can extract that as a binary category for Dutch numbers. It tells you whether it's a landline or mobile phone number. Uh, and then in the Netherlands, the first three digits on a landline are the area code. So you can extract that as an area code. So actually, if you, even though this looks like a number, it's much better to translate it to one, cat, uh, one or more categorical features. So sometimes you have a category and you need to translate it to a numeric feature because the classifier only accepts numeric features. 
There's two ways of doing that, integer coding and one-hot coding. So integer coding is just assigning an integer uh, to every, uh, every class. That's a bit problematic because this sort of implies an ordering. A numeric classifier will look at comedy as being somehow four times as big as sci-fi. That's slightly problematic. So what's better is to do what's called one-hot coding, where you take these four categories and extract them into four features, where each feature is a binary feature that tells you, does this uh, category apply or not? That's called one-hot coding, it's an important phrase, also called one of n coding, which is used a little bit less these days. Uh, and that's usually preferable. So almost always you want to do one-hot coding. And there's an example in the worksheets of how you achieve this in Pandas. It's a couple of lines of code, so it's not too difficult. Then if you have your data set translated, you have a bunch of features, you're still not done yet. You can still increase your power by um, expanding your feature space. So taking the features that you have, and blowing them up into more features, combining them into extra features can really help you. Here's an example of how that works. So let's say we're doing spam classification. We have two features. One measures the extent to which the email mentions drugs. In some sense, maybe it's count words or something. And one measures the extent to which the email was sent to a pharmacy, which also you measure somehow. Uh, you might get something like this, a distribution like this, which we've seen before. So if it mentions drugs uh, a lot, but it's not sent to a pharmacy, then it's spam. If it doesn't mention drugs, but it is sent to a pharmacy, it's also spam. Sort of slightly oversimplifying the problem, but you can sort of get the idea. Whereas an email that mentions drugs and is sent to a pharmacy is clearly a legitimate email, and an email that doesn't mention drugs and isn't sent to a pharmacy is also a legitimate email. So then you get this sort of class distribution. Um, and as we saw, this is, uh, we saw this in the second lecture called this XOR data set. This is not at all linearly separable. If we try and fit a linear classifier to this, we're in trouble. Unless we take our two features, drugs and pharmacy, we multiply them together and we add that as another feature. And what you see here is that if both features are positive, then the new feature is also positive. If both of them are negative, then the, also, the new one is also positive, and so on and so on. And if uh, one of them is negative and the other is positive, then the new feature is negative. And if we train a classifier on this, uh, the linear classifier, it can basically look at only this feature and separate on whether or not this feature is positive or negative. So just draw a line on the zero. That's a linear classifier. And it can just ignore these guys. And then it will perfectly classify this data set. So by mapping our 2D data set into a 3D data set, we have given our linear classifier the power to uh, make a nonlinear classification without making it any more, without sacrificing any of the power uh, or uh, any of the things that make a linear classifier nice, which are namely that it's a convex problem. So once we found a solution, we know that its solution is optimal. And it's very, very cheap. It still it doesn't matter how many features you add, it's still very cheap to uh, train a linear classifier. And you know you found an optimal solution. So this is a very powerful way of making a simple and uh, uh, well-performing classifier, much more powerful. Uh, here's another example. So this is a circle, so the distance to the origin here determines the classification, which you can just get from the squares of the um, individual features. And you look at the slide annotations to see how exactly that works. Uh, we'll skip this because we're a little bit behind time, but you can actually play around with this in Playground TensorFlow. Or here on the left, you see a bunch of these feature combinations. So here we have the square of the first, so here we have the two features. Uh, and here we have the XOR data set. Uh, and the features you can add to your data set are the square of either of the first features, the product of the first fe of the two features, like we, uh, we saw, and then the sign of the first feature and the sign of the second feature. So you can play around with that and see that it works. <coughs> 
It also works for regression. So if we have this sort of parabolic relation, we can see that fitting a line through that doesn't work. But if we extend the data set to two features, namely x and the square of x, then basically what you see is that we're fitting a parabola to the data. So we've extended the data set to be a two-dimensional data set, and then it becomes a parabola, because this is what a parabola looks like. So basically what you see here is that fitting a parabola, or fitting a polynomial, is basically fit, it's still, fit, still the problem of fitting a line through data, or a linear structure through data. It's still linear regression, just in a slightly higher feature space, higher dimensional feature space. So adding features is a great trick. It can make a weak classifier, uh, especially a linear one, much stronger. Uh, you can add whatever you like. Just add, apply whatever function you like to the, uh, the original features. Combine them in whatever way you like. Just play around with it. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You can just use sort of trial and error. But the nice thing is that the model stays convex. So it's easy to solve, and you know that you uh, have an optimal solution. A very common way to uh, extend your feature space is to add the cross products. So if you start with x, y, and z, you keep the original features, but you also add all products of a pair of the original features. Uh, this should say zx, the third one, uh, including with themselves. So it's not just x times y, but also x times x, and y times y, and y times z. So these are all the two-way cross products between the original features. And then you can also add all the three-way cross products and all the four-way cross products, and that blows up pretty quickly. But for linear regression, it doesn't really matter. I mean, even if you have 100,000 features, it's still pretty quick to do. So that's choosing your features. I recommend playing around with that. It's a very quick and satisfying way to get a good machine learning model. Which brings us to the break, and uh, we'll still take 15 minutes, and then after the break, we'll continue with normalization. All right. <clears throat> Let's get started again with normalization. So, to motivate, let's look at the k nearest neighbor. This picture, as you should know by now. K nearest neighbor classifier. If you missed the last two lectures, uh, remember the K nearest neighbor classifier looks at the K nearest points in the feature space to classify a new point, like the point with the uh, question mark. It looks at the K nearest points in the feature space and takes the um, majority class among them and guesses that as the class of the unknown point. So let's say what. Uh, let's see what happens here if you have two features with varying scales. Two features with their own units and their own meanings. So here we have, uh, we have year of birth and pupil dilation. So the year of birth ranges from, let's say, 1950 to uh, 2020. And pupil dilation in meters ranges from 0 0.001 to uh, 0 0.00 or something else. Uh, so what you see, that if you plot your data as a point cloud, uh, and k is 2, then the class is about equal probability between red and blue. But actually, if you look at the distances, this one is tiny, and this one is massive. So is that justified? Should we go for the blue point because it's closer? to the uh, target point? I would say no, because these numeric values mean different things. One is bigger because years are bigger, and more importantly, you cannot compare these numeric values anyway because they have different units. One is a unit of distance, and one is a unit of time. So you don't want to actually look at the absolute value as given because the units don't necessarily compare to each other. What you want is to give the data a uniform scale, which you see happens if you plot the data so that everything fits into one square. You see that this distance actually becomes the same roughly as this distance. And doing that is called normalization, giving the data its own scale 
so that a classifier can operate on it. And it's very easy. And we'll look at three ways of doing it. <coughs> uh, there are different names for all of them, and there's not really a uniform way of talking about these things. We'll call them this. So we'll call mapping the data to a range of 0 and 1 normalization. We'll call mapping the data to a one-dimensional standard normal distribution. So giving it 0, mean, and variance 1. We'll call that standardization. And uh, mapping the data to a multivariate normal distribution. So uh, uh, looking at all the uh, features and how they correlate together and decorrelating all the features together, we'll call that whitening. <coughs> but be aware that when you Google these terms, uh, when you go outside the confines of this course, they may be used interchangeably. So when you see this written down somewhere else, you need to make sure that you know exactly what, uh, what people mean by it. Uh, but this is how we'll tell them apart within this course. So normalization is a simple formula. <clears throat> this is our data here. Uh, we want to map this data to the range from 0 to 1. So we want to scale it linearly so that the smallest element ends up at 0 and the biggest element ends up at 1. So we compute the range, which is the maximum min minus the minimum, which is this. We subtract from x the minimum. So this is the smallest point, the minimum. Uh, so subtracting from all x the minimum just takes this whole range and shifts it a bit down so that it this oh sorry this point hits zero this point hits zero uh, but then this point is still too big still bigger than one so we divide the whole thing by the size of the range so that this range is squeezed into the uh, range from zero to one that's called normalization. Very simple, and you do this for every feature independently. So every feature has its own x min and its own x max. So you apply this function and you get uh, a uh, data set for which all the numbers in all the features are between 0 and 1. And then you see that k nearest neighbors has this distance, uh, this distances that it can compare that are meaningful. <coughs> you can also do standardization where instead of fitting to a range, you fit to a sort of uh, uh, ideal standard normal distribution. So the standard normal distribution is the one that has mean zero and variance one, or standard deviation one. Um, and the formula looks very similar. So first we compute the mean, and we compute the standard deviation. Then we shift the whole thing so that the mean hits zero. So that's subtracting the mean from everything. And then we divide so that the blue bar is exactly uh, the size of the uh, 0, 1, so that the standard deviation becomes 1. So again, we subtract the mean and we divide by a measure of the width of our data. And then we get something like this. So here we don't have a fixed interval for our data, but we do know that it's centered on the mean. And uh, if, it's, if it's a symmetric distribution, then as many points will be above 0 as will be below 0. Uh, that's called standardization, or at least we call it standardization. Um, and this is sort of a good moment to break because there's a lot of mathematics coming up now and the bulk of the rest of what we're going to do is uh, going to be more complicated than this. So this is a good moment to say this is basically all you need to do. This is all you need to worry about. So this is very important if you start doing machine learning. Normalize your data or standardize your data. It uh, doesn't really matter which you pick. Most models are fine with either. Uh, but you can do it independently for each feature. That's fine. And this works fine. And we're going to point out some problems with it, but they're not actual problems in data science, and they won't be problems for your projects. So just do this and try whatever model you want to try. And the rest is just interesting, and you might use it if you like. But you don't have to. So let's see what happens to a data set with two features if we do this um, standardization, if we map to a normal distribution. Uh, so here we have a point cloud of a data set with two features that are not normalized, not standardized. 
we standardize both features, it looks like this. So this looks like a standard normal distribution. It's centered on the mean. It has no correlation, so it's a nice uh, circle, noisy circle. Uh, and in both distances, the spread, the variance is equal. So that's exactly what we want. We want to map the data back so that it looks like normal, a standard normal distribution. The same if we have a, a more a horizontal looking data set. We normalize it so the mean gets to the mean and the variance is one in each direction. <clears throat> so that's exactly what we want. But if the data is slightly, if the features are slightly correlated, so you can predict one feature from another, so they sort of form a line or a rough line, and you normalize each feature independently, what you get is this. Now this is not a standard normal distribution. This is, uh, uh, there's still lots of correlation here, and this is sort of still flat. So like I say, this is normally fine. You can run any machine learning model on this you like. They operate with it uh, perfectly well. But it's not mapping back to this normal distribution. Even though this is a normal distribution, uh, it's not mapping back because we have this correlation in there. So the question is, if we uh, take these uh, features into account and if we somehow take into account how these features are correlated, can we actually map back to a standard normal distribution? So what we want is from this data set, which has the mean all the way over there, and this uh, skew, this correlation, we want to translate it, normalize it so that it looks like this. And one very informative way of thinking about it is that instead of um, mapping the data to the origin, mapping this data to this data, we can actually think of this as taking the axes of our uh, coordinate system and mapping the axes to the data. So here you see we keep the data where it is, but we get some new axes informed by what the data looks like uh, that sort of map this orientation of the internal orientation of the data. And then if the data is very stretched out, we stretch out the axis. And if the uh, data is very squished, we squish the axis. And this is a normal distribution because in this direction, the variance is one, and in this direction, the variance is one, and there's no correlation. So how do we do this? One reminder of some basic linear algebra before we start. Uh, summing vectors, you probably know how this works, but just to remind you, if you have a vector A and a vector B, <clears throat> and you sum them together, what you do is you take the tail end of one of the vectors and you stick it on the uh, arrow end of uh, the head of the other vector, and then the vector from the red tail to the uh, green head is the sum of the two vectors. It's just what summing vectors looks like visually. <coughs> the reason I bring this up is that this is a way to think about our standard coordinate system. So you've all done this uh, <clears throat> in high school. You have a point, and the point is three point uh, is. Uh, 3 comma 2, 3, well, new markers, 3 comma 2. Then you learn very early on that that's 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 3, and then it's that point. <clears throat> you can actually think about that as summing vectors. So there are two basis vectors, two vectors on which the whole coordinate system is built, whole, this whole Cartesian coordinate system is built. Those are the green, uh, the green and the red vector, A and B. And saying that a point has coordinates 3 and 2, we can interpret as just saying take three copies of the first basis vector, the red vector, and add to it two copies of the, uh, and take two copies of the second basis vector, the B vector, and add them all together. And that gives you our point. So if we take three copies of the red vector and we add them together and we add to that two copies of the green vector, we get point x. And you see that if you work that out, adding all those vectors together, then clearly you get to the point 3, 2. 
why is that an important perspective on this coordinate system? Because we can do this with different vectors as well. We can change the basis vectors. So instead of these nice orthogonal vectors of length one oriented in the uh, directions parallel to our uh, paper, we can pick two arbitrary new vectors, a purple one and an orange one. And we can say, in this basis system, what are the coordinates of our point? How many copies of this purple vector do I need to add to how many copies of the uh, orange vector in order to get to our point? So I eyeballed this, <clears throat> but this is roughly what the points are and what the, uh, what the vectors are. So these are more or less these vectors in the original basis. Uh, in the original basis. These are our new basis vectors expressed in the original basis. And then roughly, if you eyeball it, you see that uh, you get to the point x, xs, if you add two purple vectors to uh, two and a half purple vectors to one half uh, orange vector, which means, and that's uh, x2 is 3, 2 in the original basis, is 3, 2, which means that in the new basis, the coordinates of our point, let's call that xb, is two and a half and 0 0.5, because we're adding two and a half of one basis to 0 0.5 of the other basis. So this is the point expressed in a new coordinate system. So now we know how to translate from one coordinate system to another. If we want to go from uh, x to b, oh, sorry, from s to b, so from the standard basis to the original basis, Sorry, no, we do it the other way around, that's easier. So if we want to go from the new basis to the standard basis, the easiest thing to do is to take our basis vectors and arrange them as the columns of a matrix. And then this uh, operation that we saw here, this uh, adding bunch of uh, matrices together is just multiplying a vector by that matrix. So we multiply the coordinates in our original basis system by this basis matrix, and that gives us, uh, no, sorry, we multiply the coordinates of the new basis, in the new basis, by the basis matrix, and that gives us the standard coordinates. So that's transform basis transformation in one direction. If we want to go in the other direction, we can invert this formula. So we need the inverse of B. Uh, matrix inversion is always a pain, so we don't usually want to do that for various reasons. It's numerically unstable and only works on square matrices. Uh, if you want to get rid of this matrix inversion, you can make sure that your basis is orthonormal, which means that the uh, basis vectors are orthogonal to each other, so right angle, which we did have in this uh, example from the last slide. So these purple, the purple one and the orange one are orthogonal to each other but they also have to be unit vectors. So their length also has to be one, which is not the case for this one. So this is not an orthonormal basis. Uh, for that to be true, they have to be both one. So you're really only allowed to rotate the standard basis or flip it. But if you do have an orthonormal basis, then you can show that the inverse of the matrix B is equal to its transpose. And transpose is really easy to compute. So then you can easily transform back and forth between bases. So that's really nice. Uh, so if you're working with these bases, what you really want is an orthonormal basis so that you can transform back and forth uh, very easily. And then if you do want to stretch as well, you can do just do the stretching separately. So you can just take an orthonormal basis and apply a stretch as well. Um, and we'll go into that in a later lecture. But now let's look how do, how do we apply this. So this we now know what this is. This is a basis transformation. What we're looking for is basis transformation that maps the standard coordinates to our uh, the sort of um, internal coordinates of our data, coordinates that map that match our data. So how do we work out which transformation that is? Uh, in order to do that, we need to look a little bit at uh, the definition of uh, the properties of the multivariate normal distribution. So that looks like this. It's a bit like a standard norm, like a 1D normal distribution. So it has a mean, which is a vector. It's just a point in space. It's just a 
mean point between all these uh, other points. And it has a covariance. So the area, the values on the diagonal are the variances in the direction of the axis. And the uh, various, the off diagonal values are all the cross correlations between the dimensions. It's always symmetric, by the way. So the a value at the top right is the same as the value at the bottom left. And the multivariate normal distribution also has a standard one, which is the one that has the mean at the origin. So the mean is zero, zero. It has no correlations, and the variance is one in every direction. So this, the uh, covariance matrix is the identity matrix, and the mean is zero. And then you get this nice point cloud that we want for our, uh, our whitened data. Uh, you can fit a multivariate normal distribution to your data. So if you're fitting a 1D normal distribution to your data, you compute the mean and you compute the standard deviation, the sample mean and the sample standard deviation, if you want to be precise. In this case, we can also compute the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. So the sample mean is just the mean of all the vectors. You sum them all up and then divide them by the number of vectors you have. Uh, to compute the standard deviation, sample standard, uh, sorry, the sample covariance matrix, you mean subtract the data. So you take the whole point cloud, you shift it so that its origin is on the uh, on zero, and then you compute this. And I won't go into this any deeper. We'll just take this as read. We can compute a very good approximation of the original uh, covariance. And that will help us because we can think of multivariate normal distributions as transformations. So let's say we are sampling from a distribution, and we do that by sampling from a, a standard normal distribution. So we sample a point from standard normal distribution, call that point x, and then we transform that point by a linear transformation. So we multiply it by a matrix A, and we add some vector t. It turns out that the point after transformation is distributed also according to a normal distribution, and that normal distribution has its mean at t, so that's easy. And its covariance is a times tra a transpose. So basically what this says is if you apply any affine transformation, any linear transformation, to the normal distribution, so you get this sort of uh, circle of points, you transform all the points, and then the points are still normally distribu distributed, and they are normally distributed with these parameters. So if we start with a normal distribution here, a standard normal distribution, so we're doing the opposite of what we want to achieve, but we'll invert the operation later. So we start with the st standard normal distribution. This is the sort of line where everything has the same probability density. This is a point. This is show how the distribution works, how the uh, transformation works. We apply some transformation matrix, which stretches and squeezes and rotates it, so the circle becomes an ellipse and the one point is now this point, this blue point here. And then we add some translation. We can map our original data, uh, we can map the standard normal distribution to our data. And to invert this, all we need to do is compute the S and M from the data, so we estimate the sample covariance and the sample mean. We figure out some a such that s is a uh, times a transpose, because remember, uh, that's the distribution of our new data. Uh, so this is a tricky bit of linear algebra. There's lots of decompositions that help you do this. The Cholesky, Cholesky decomposition, singular value decomposition, or the symmetric square root. We'll leave that, we'll just assume that we can do this. We'll look at this uh, SVD uh, a lot later. And then we just whiten the data by reverting, inverting this transformation. So we now have a transformation, A and T, and we just subtract this mean, which is the, the translation part of the transformation, and we multiply by the matrix inverse of A, and we get our whitened data. Uh, so that's a good question. Why would we whiten the data? I will leave the answer for later. Um, it's, we'll, we'll see this very clearly with the eigenfaces, exactly what the whitened data will tell us. 
uh, but it's easier to explain if I explain the dimensionality reduction first. Which we get to now. So for now, let's just say this is widening the data. We'll look at uh, why it's important a little bit later. Ah, right, so yeah, um, I wasn't clear about that. So we're, uh, the question is, uh, what if we have multiple classes? Uh, basically, what we're doing now is we're looking at the data without looking at the classes. So you can either think of this as just all the data, which has some distribution, or you can do it separately for each class. That sort of depends on your data. If you think the data as a whole has a nice coherent distribution together, then I'll, you can apply this. Uh, actually, probably usually you just want to ignore the class and apply this to the data, to all the data. No, no, so it's, it's not the case that you have only one class. So think of um, the example we saw in the first lecture where we were classifying between men and women. We just ignore the class distribution. We look at the whole point cloud colored red and blue, uh, then apply this, and then, but then start looking at the classes, basically. Uh, that's the same for normalization as well. You want to normalize over all the data independent of classes. Um, so for now, that's normalization. But we'll come back to it a little bit later. Hopefully, there's time. Um, but we have to look at uh, dimensionality reduction first because that's more, sort of more interesting than it sounds. Um, but basically, let's look at the basic problem. What if you have too many features? If you have lots of features, like uh, if you have lots of features and your machine learning model cannot handle lots of features, then you need to reduce the dimensionality in such a way that you retain as much information, as much valuable information as possible. There are two options. One is feature selection, where you throw out a bunch of the features and you try and retain those features which are the most informative. Um, and the nice thing there is that the features retain their original meaning, so everything's still interpretable. And there's dimensionality reduction, where instead you want to use information from all the features, but you learn a simple mapping from lots of features to few features, new features, all new features, such that um, you hope uh, most of the information is retained. You have to throw away some of the information, but you try and retain as much information as possible. Uh, and for now, we'll focus only on unsupervised methods. So again, methods that ignore the labels and just look at the whole thing as one big point cloud. So that looks like this. We uh, hope you remember this from the first lecture. We had this digit data set where every pixel was a feature. So we had lots and lots of features. We have 784 features. Uh, so that's a lot, too much for some data sets, for some uh, machine learning models. So a dimensionality reduction would map this to, say, three new features which we'll call Z1, Z2, and Z3, which are all new, new values, and everyone is a, uh, everyone takes information from all the features in the original data set in some way that we're going to talk about. We're going to figure out how to do that. And the classes, class labels are the same. And that's our new data set, and that we can now feed to models that uh, don't handle many features very well. And we'll just look at one method called principal component analysis. And to illustrate how that works, we'll start with uh, reducing to just one dimension. So we'll reduce the whole data set to just one feature. So we have just one Z, one scalar value for every image. Because uh, that's the easiest to explain. We throw away lots of information, probably too much information, but we'll see how we then build up to more features later. Uh, and we'll make, up, uh, we'll make uh, two assumptions. One, that the data is mean-centered. Uh, that is, so we compute the mean and we subtract the mean. Just makes things easier. So uh, the mean is, is, is at zero. And uh, we assume that we want a linear transformation. And this is slightly counterintuitive, but we're not going to start with the transformation that creates Z. We're going to start with a transformation that reconstructs X, because we want, like I said, we want a transformation that retains as much uh, information about the original features as possible. So we're going to frame this whole thing as uh, trying to find the 
dimensionality reduction that minimizes the reconstruction loss. If we're reconstructing x from z, so we take z, our new features, and we map it back to some x prime, which we hope is close to x. These are vectors. This is the number. Uh, then we want this distance to be as small as possible. We will, they will not be the same because we're mapping, we're losing information, but we want this to be uh, as small as possible. And we'll take a linear transformation to make things easier. So basically for every feature in the original feature space x, we learn one coefficient c. So for x1, we learn the coefficient c1. And z multiplied by c1 should be approximately equal to x1. And z multiplied by cm should be approximately equal to xm. So that basically means that z multiplied by the vector c, so these coefficients arranged in a vector, gives us a reconstruction of the point x called x prime, and that should be as close as possible to x. And that's where we'll start. So given those assumptions, how do we uh, find a good value c? Uh, so let's look at that in two dimensions to illustrate what, uh, what is happening. So we have our point x prime which is uh, computed as z times c. And our uh, question is, first of all, for a given c, what is the optimal x prime? So if you remember your linear algebra, you know that the x prime that is closest to x, but it's on this line c, so all these uh, z times c are on this dotted line, uh, is the point where the line between the two blue points makes a right angle. That's the closest point to x. Uh, so we'll call that zc. So we have to figure out what, given c, what this value z is. Given c, what is this value that gives us this uh, point? Uh, we can use a little bit of uh, trigonometry here. So we draw a, this is a right triangle. So we know, the Dutch people will know, sos cos toa. So cos, the cosine is the aanliggend, uh, schuin gedeelte aanliggend. So the cosine is this blue one divided by the orange one from the origin 2x. Uh, so this distance is this value here. Um, now we can define c in different ways, because we don't, it doesn't really matter how big c is. This line will still be the same, the orange line. If we make c bigger or smaller, the line will still be the same. So to constrain our problem, we'll say that the length of c is 1, which means we can just add it. Because it's 1, we can add it. And now we see that this here is just the dot product. Remember, this is the geometric definition of the dot product. So this distance is the dot product. Uh, and since c is 1, uh, z is just how many times we multiply this to get to x. And since c is 1, z is just the dot product. So given c, we can now compute z. That's the whole point of this. All we, do, all we have to do is choose c. And z follows from c, because we can just take the dot product. So given a cloud of points, we pick some arbitrary c. There it is. And we take the dot product. And the dot products are the projections of the data onto our line c. Uh, and as you can see, these gray arrows show this uh, projection. Um, so this is not a very good line that I've chosen here, c because these distances between x and the reconstruction to x are huge. So what we want to do is fit this line properly, which is very similar to linear regression. Not quite the same, but very similar. Uh, so we can state our objective like this. We have, we have our reconstruction. We subtract our actual value, and we want that value to be minimized. So we want to sort of turn these gray lines into rubber bands that pull on the line. So we fill everything in. I have to rush through this a little bit. But basically, this is our minimization objective. It's just a sort of least squares minimization objective. Such that, remember, c is 1. That's important. Uh, so we haven't done constrained optimization yet, so we don't know how to optimize using constraints. Um, let's just take my word for it. In this case, it's really easy. Uh, so you can do gradient descent if you figure out a simple way to add in this constraint. You can do gradient descent, for instance, or you can work out a solution. We'll not worry about that now. But this is the optimal fit. And we call that the first principal component of our data. 
So that's our data reduced to one dimension. What, so what do we do if we want more dimensions? Because one dimension is usually not enough. We repeat the process on the remaining directions. So the second principal component is the unit vector that is orthogonal to one, to C1, and which together with C1 minimizes the reconstruction loss. And then for a third principal component, you want a component that is orthogonal to the first two. So now you're in three dimensions, so there's three orthogonal directions. That together with the first two minimizes the loss, and so on and so on. So if you've heard about principal component analysis before, you might think that's not what I remember. I remember it being about variance, not about reconstructions. Turns out that's the same thing. Because the first principal component is also the direction in which the variance is max maximized. Why should that be so? Because of the law of Pythagoras. So here we see the data. Here's our point x. Again, a right angle triangle. Uh, and what you see is this dotted line, that's what we choose. That's what we angle to pick our, uh, our first principal component. Uh, the uh, black arrow is our, is our uh, reconstruction loss from the projection to the real point. The orange arrow is our uh, variance. So since the p squared is fixed, we can either maximize this value or minimize this value. It's the same thing. Uh, I'm rushing through it a little bit, apologies for that. Uh, but I want to save some time for the eigenfaces. So there's a question of how to choose a number of principal components. You can sort of plot the loss or plot the variance against the number of components, and you see usually this inflection point. So that tells you these first four components capture most of the information of the data. They explain most of the variance in the data, or they give us the best reconstruction. And for the rest, it doesn't really matter uh, whether we include them. Um, <clears throat> so there's a third perspective to finally answer your question. Um, or we start to answer your question now, which is that if we look at these principal components, they're also a new basis system. And they are a new basis system which, in which the, uh, the set vector uh, gives us a direction that uh, the first principal component, the first axis, gives us the direction of maximum variance. They're orthogonal to each other. Uh, they're unit vectors, so it's a unit basis. And these zs give us the amount of stretch we need to, re uh, we need to apply in order to get to a variance of 1. So PCA, if we keep going, we don't cut it off, and if we keep adding all the components until the number of components is the same as our original data, we don't have dimensionality reduction anymore, but we have whitened our data. So that's called PCA whitening, uh, and that gives you a whitening method, and it also shows you why whitening is important, because whitening gives you these intrinsic dimensions to the data. It gives you these principal components. And then with principal component analysis, you also get them ordered by, from maximum variance to minimal variance. That's called PCA whitening. So again, if you've heard about PCA before, you might think, wasn't there something about eigenvectors and singular value decompositions? <clears throat> That's only if you want to compute it efficiently and if you want to understand what's happening under the hood then you really need to um, dig into eigenvectors, and that's what we're going to do in week six. So we're coming back to this, and we'll study it uh, in a little bit more detail, but for now, this is what PCA does. So it's a linear transformation that minimizes the MC loss, maximizes the variance, or uh, performs this whitening transformation. So that's all very theoretical and very abstract. If you'll allow me to go five minutes over my time, I'll show you some examples of just how powerful this is. So here's the first example. Uh, this is how um, anatomists often use PCA. So an anatomist can look at a piece of bone like this, like these uh, six pieces of bone here that look exactly the same to us, and say, oh, well, that's obviously chimpanzee, that's a human, and that's a hominid, an early hominid, and that one's worth a million bucks, and that one's worth nothing. 
how do they do that? They don't know. It's sort of you learn, you study for 20 years, and then you, uh, you're able to do that. But that makes it very difficult to quantify that you found a very rare hominin fossil. And you want to publish it, and you want to say, look, I found something proper. And it's not enough to say, because I can see that it's special. So what they do is they measure a bunch of things, like machine learning. They get some features, so they measure from this point to this point to distance, from that point to this point to distance. They measure 120 features uh, of some uh, very, uh, very normal fossils and this one very special fossil. And then they do PCA. They reduce it down to the first two principal components. And then they plot. And then they say, well, look, chimps end up here. Humans end up here. And this new very special fossil, uh, let's say uh, Afarensis, ends up right in the middle. So that's an old fossil that is just between chimps and humans. So that's a good way to think about high dimensional data. It's a slightly more magical example already. So what the authors did for this study, they took a bunch of European people. They sequenced their DNA, and they took, um, let's see, uh, uh, 500,000 features, markers on this DNA. So a big data set of 3,000 by 500,000. Apply PCA, first two principal components. The colors are added later, and you see this. Does this remind you of anything already? It's basically the map of Europe. And it, it, uh, the colors are added later, but basically the Spanish people all end up here, the British people end up here, etc. So if I take all your DNA, or the DNA of a bunch of European people, I send it to aliens who don't know what the Earth looked like, they sequence the DNA and apply principal component analysis, they can work out the geography of Earth based on that. They can work out where the coastlines are. Which brings us to eigenfaces very quickly. So if we take a data set of faces, we flatten them out like we did with the digits into vectors, then we can apply PCA to that as well. So we get the mean, for instance, looks like this, mean face. And we can get the components, they look like this. And what we can then do is take the first, uh, start with the mean, and apply the first uh, eigenvector to the mean, and sort of move along the first eigenvector. So we're in this big space, this high 4,000-dimensional uh, space, we're moving in one direction, along the first principal component. So there's the mean in the middle, and what you see is that in one direction the person gets a little older, and in the other direction the person gets a little younger. So the first principal component of this data expresses age, roughly. The second expresses the lightning, I think, whether the lightning is, lighting is on the left or the right. Uh, this is smiling versus frowning, third component. Male versus female, by the looks of it. And also, I think, smiling versus not smiling. So just from a linear transformation, you can make somebody smile or not smile. Because you can also start, we started with the mean here, but you can also start with a random data point and apply the princi first principal component to make somebody older, make somebody lit from a different direction, make somebody look female-ish or more male, or make somebody smile. And you can see from here, this is a nice one, the mouth genuinely opens. This is just a linear transformation on this pixel space. So that's why whitening is important, because it gives you these intrinsic data directions and the intrinsic data directions often conform to these kinds of latent features in your data. That's all I had for you today. Thank you for your attention, and I'll see you on Monday.